Today marks nine months since Vermont's first fatalities from COVID-19. As we have on the 19th of every month since, I've ordered flags to half staff to honor their memory and remind us why the sacrifices we're making are so important. On this day, I ask all Vermonters to think about the 193 Vermonters we've lost. Think about those who love them, friends and family of members left behind. And think about the responsibility each of us has and the choices we make to help protect those who are vulnerable due to their age or certain health conditions. I'm really proud of how Vermonters have stepped up to do their part. That's why Vermont continues to have one, if not the lowest uh, death rate in the country. And fortunately, we've seen a significant decrease in deaths and hospitalizations since January. Our vaccine strategy is a major part of this as well, but it's up to each of us to keep this moving in the right direction, and that means following the public health guidance. Now, I know we're all getting tired of it, but the better we do now, while we continue to vaccinate those at greatest risk of hospitalization and death, the faster we can get back to normal. About 95% of Vermont's deaths have been people over 65. So every dose that's diverted from this population puts them at risk and slows down our exit strategy because after the oldest Vermonters and those with certain conditions are vaccinated, our healthcare system won't be at risk and fatalities should be rare and we can begin to return to normal. And as a reminder, Vermont has one of the oldest populations in the nation, which makes our strategy even that more important. Fortunately, we're making great progress. And since we opened registration to those 70 and older on Tuesday, over 21,000 in that age band have already signed up, which means we'll be able to open to the next phase very soon. Next, uh, I was asked uh, Tuesday about the status of the Vermont National Guard deployment to Washington, DC. I'm happy to report our mission is complete and our soldiers are returning the home this weekend. As a reminder, I approved this deployment just over one month ago because states were asked to help ensure the peaceful transition of power following the violent insurrection at our capital. We were asked to extend the mission because of their performance and professionalism. We should all be very proud of how they represented us so well. And I want to thank all the members of our guard for their service and for helping defend our most basic democratic principles. Finally, we're announcing a couple of changes to our guidance today. In a few minutes, Secretary Smith will talk about changes to long-term care facility protocols as we complete vaccinations of residents. And as I previewed on Tuesday, we're announcing a change to our travel policy. Earlier this month, the CDC issued encouraging new guidance around quarantine for those who have been fully vaccinated. As a result, we considered the impact this would have on our guidance. And as a result, we found many things it could impact. There are literally dozens of what if and what about questions. And we started working through a number of these. But I wanna be very clear. We're going to do this carefully and methodically, like we have throughout the pandemic. And I'm asking for your patience as we work our way through this. So today, I can announce one significant step forward relating to travel. Effective this Tuesday, those who are fully vaccinated, meaning two weeks after their second dose, will not need to quarantine after that travel. This also means those who come to Vermont from other states will not need to quarantine if they can prove they have been fully vaccinated. Of course, they'll still need to comply with all our other health guidance like masking and distancing. Again, this change is very narrow, focusing on travel. And I know there will be a lot of questions and some head scratching about why this is allowed while other things are not. But the fact is every step we make comes with questions and we're taking it one step at a time to lessen the confusion. The next step we're working through is how vaccinations will impact multi-household gatherings. 
and we're also looking at returning to a trusted uh, household policy. And we'll have further announcements next week on those issues. I hope you see this as I do, because it's incredibly encouraging news, as it means the light at the end of the tunnel is getting bigger and brighter. We're one step closer to returning to normal, and as more and more Vermonters receive their vaccine, we'll make more turns of the spigot. Again, I know this raises a lot of questions, and we'll address them methodically, but please understand, we're going to take this one step at a time and continue to be guided by the science, the data, and the advice of our experts. So with that, I'll turn it over to Secretary French for our weekly education update. Thank you, Governor. Good morning. I think you're on mute, Dan, or we're not hearing you. Can you hear me? We still can't hear you. Starting to hear you now. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you, Dan. Okay. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, good morning. Um, I will begin my report with an update on our weekly surveillance testing of school staff. About half our schools were on winter vacation this week, and the other half are out next week. This made the logistics behind the testing a bit more complex than normal. Uh, some of the testing had to be rescheduled. That being said, we administered 620 tests this week, which is about a 26% participation rate. So far, no positive cases have been identified, so the positivity rate is zero. Statewide positivity rate is 1.8%. We collect monthly data from our schools as to what extent they're offering in-person, remote, and hybrid learning. The data from the January survey were recently published, so I thought I'd provide a summary of this information. The data continued to show a great deal of stability in the operations of our schools. In January, 55% of all schools were in hybrid mode, 30% were in person, and about 15% were fully remote. When we break this data down by grade level, we continue to see about half our elementary schools were operating at full in person. 25% of our middle schools were in full in person, and 10% of our high schools. Again, I think the major conclusion from these data is school operations have remained fairly stable. January, January in particular was a very challenging month in terms of virus activity in our communities. And in spite of these conditions, over 80% of our schools were able to maintain some degree of in-person instruction. I think we can draw two conclusions from these data. On the one hand, the mitigation strategies required of our schools work. And on the other hand, our schools have obtained operational fluency in implementing them on a daily basis. I think it is important to acknowledge that the achievement of this stability requires a tremendous amount of attention to detail in mitigation fundamentals and in communications. It takes a lot of hard work on the part of state employees and school staff and the active support of students and their families to make this all work. The success of our school operation is a direct result of their dedication to their schools, the students, and our communities. The CDC released updated guidance for schools last Friday. Uh, the U.S. Department of Ed also released companion guidance to support schools with implementing the CDC guidance. After initial review, I do not expect the new federal guidance will have much impact on Vermont's guidance for schools for now. The new CDC guidance seems to be directed more at those places in our country that never reopened their schools or are just starting to do so. We remain confident that our guidance is well designed and works well since we have very good testing system in place, both among the general population and among school staff, and the results of the testing consistently demonstrate our success. We had scheduled a normal review of our guidance this month, so our team will evaluate the federal guidance very closely and to see if we can improve ours in any way. On another topic related to federal guidance, uh, we continue to examine our options for implementing the SBAC achievement testing this spring. Our options in this regard are highly limited to what the U.S. Department of Education says they are, since these tests are required under federal law. Last spring, a national testing waiver was issued. We are expecting the U.S. Department of Education to issue guidance on testing for this spring, but probably not an outright waiver. 
It is not clear, however, as to how much flexibility they will impart to states in their guidance. We have seen a few states pursue waivers that are testing under the general waiver authority of the Every Student Succeeds Act, or what's called ESSA. We do not believe any of these waivers have been approved, however, and it is not clear if the general waiver provisions of ESSA are appropriate for the specific circumstances of the pandemic. On the one hand, we are, remain interested in having data for the patterns of student achievement in our state, especially since our students have experienced a variety of learning settings over the year, and the data would be, could be very useful for us in targeting and focusing our work in the recovery phase. On the other hand, uh, our test, the SBAC, and not every state uh, gives the same test, but our test, the SBAC, takes a significant amount of time away from direct instruction, in many cases more than a week. Uh, we are concerned that this would be too much of time away from direct instruction at a time when more in-person contact for all students needs to be a priority. If we are provided some flexibility in our decision making, our priority on maximizing in-person instruction will likely be the most compelling consideration for us in deciding whether or not to hold the testing this year. We should know more on this in the coming weeks. That concludes my update. I'll now turn it over to Secretary Smith. Thanks, Secretary French. Good morning, everyone. As many of you know, as of Tuesday, February 16th, any Vermonter age 70 and older can make an appointment to receive their first dose of COVID-19 vaccine. We received an overwhelming response this week, and as the governor said, as of today, 21,400 Vermonters age 70 and older have made appointments through our community vaccination program since Tuesday. If you wish to make an appointment to receive a vaccine and you are 70 years old or older, please visit the Health Department website at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine or call our call center at 855-722-7878. We've also added additional vaccine appointments for next week in Essex Junction, St. Johnsbury, Rutland, Brattleboro, and St. Albans. If you would like to make or change an appointment uh, to make it uh, sooner, please call our call center at 855-722-7878. In addition, those 65 years old and older uh, will be able to make an appointment as early as the first week of March. I would encourage this age group to go online at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine and set up an account ahead of time. So when we announce a date to register, you, you will already have an established account and can simply go to the account and pick a place, date, and time to get vaccinated. Now let's look at our progress with the community vaccination program. Over 83,000 eligible Vermonters have been vaccinated against COVID-19. 41,000 Vermonters have received their first dose. 42,000 have received their second dose. So far, uh, 58,000, uh, excuse me, so far 58% of Vermonters in the 75 years old and above group and 9% of Vermonters in the 70 to 75 years old and above group, as well as 1,100 homebound Vermonters have received their first dose of COVID-19 vaccine. This week, vaccinations for homebound individuals will occur in every Vermont county. Our planned allocation for next week is 720 doses with the assistance from hospitals, primary care offices, and area agencies of aging our home health and EMS partners are working to identify homebound community members that do not receive home health services. As you may know, the state of Vermont has worked to protect some of the most vulnerable Vermonters living in long-term care facilities uh, against severe illness or even death. In fact, out of the 193 deaths, that have occurred in Vermont from COVID-19, 125 have, were residents of long-term care facilities. Many of these residents were the first to see restrictions placed upon them back in March of 2020. 
And although we've loosened restrictions in the summer of 2020, we had to tighten things up back up again in the fall and, and into the new year when we had multiple outbreaks and unfortunately deaths in our long-term care facilities. As we continue to roll out a successful vaccination strategy in our long-term care settings, and as we see the corresponding reduction in the number of outbreaks and deaths in those facilities, we are able to reevaluate our recommendations and ease some of the restrictions that those residents have experienced over the course of the pandemic. Now, we feel safe. We feel it's safer than it has before because of our ability to vaccinate some of the most vulnerable Vermonters. All of our uh, skilled nursing facilities have received both the first and second dose. And in terms of all skilled nursing facilities, assisted living facilities and res residential care facilities, 93% of residents have received their first dose and 74% have completed their second dose. Nearly th uh, three-fourths of staff have completed their first dose and half have completed their second dose. We're happy to announce that next week, effective February 26, residents living in long-term care facilities in areas where there have been no COVID-19 outbreaks will be encouraged to follow the guidelines, the following guidelines. Um, encouragement to use full vaccination status as a factor, but not the sold factor, in planning for such things as congregate activities within a facility. This means beginning to allow congregate settings if the facility is within the CMS or Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services guidelines for county positivity rates. This means eating together, and participating in other group activities within guidelines. On a case-by-case -case consideration, safe physical contact and recommendations for allowing that contact in specific circumstances, which includes full vaccination status. Some modifications to quarantine requirements for residents and with full vaccination, having visitors indoors participating in non and participating in non-medical essential services such as salon appointments. Just for uh, information purposes, fully vaccinated means greater than or equal to two weeks following the receipt of the second dose in a two-dose series or greater than or equal to two weeks following receipt of one dose of a single-dose vaccine. While the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, have not issued new regulations for long-term care facilities. These updated recommendations reflect progress made with our vaccination efforts for residents and staff. It's important to note that CMS continues to require staff surveillance testing in CMS certified skilled nursing facilities based on the prevalence if COVID-19, based on the prevalence of COVID-19 in individual counties. And equally important, our update, updated guidance continues to highlight safe practices related to infection prevention and control. Even as we move through the successful vaccination process, we want to ensure that we are providing the safest and highest quality environment for Vermont's long-term care facility res residents. We will continue to work closely with CMS and CDC to monitor changes in regulations and to translate those practices right here in Vermont. We are happy to announce this milestone, but it's also important to maintain necessary safety precautions, such as wearing masks, hand washing, and keeping a six foot distance. The Department of Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living and the Vermont Department of Health have collaborated with our facility partners on this updated guidance, and I want to thank everyone for their work to make this guidance successful. I also want to change to another subject. I want to provide an, an important update regarding a federal initiative called the Farmer to Family Food Box Program. In the month of February, the USDA program has had significant challenges with the food box distribution program. The governor has instructed me 
to fix those issues so that this federal government program is as seamless as it was once in distributing food to Vermonters. In the coming weeks, we will intervene and work with the, with the uh, USDA and partner with the Vermont Food Bank to ensure these supplemental food boxes are distributed equitably to Vermonters. As a result, food boxes will be ready for Vermonters to receive them on March 1st. Like other farmers to food box rounds, you can use the online registration system to receive a food box. The website is humanresources.vermont.gov slash food dash help. Beginning next week, the website will be updated with available days and locations for March. Those, uh, inter uh, those without internet access can call uh, Vermont 211 to register. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine for a health update. Thank you. <clears throat> Today we're reporting 97 cases. We're down to 37 patients in the hospital, 13 in the ICU, and a positivity rate of 1.8%. As I mentioned on Tuesday, fortunately, the higher rate of spread of the virus has improved in Bennington and Rutland counties, though we do continue to monitor Franklin County where we believe the increase in number of cases is due to community transmission. As we've experienced, when there are high levels of community transmission, this can result in more cases in schools and in workplaces. Enosburg Elementary School, which was discussed on Tuesday, is a good example. <clears throat> of the 12 cases I reported, only three cases there were associated with the school and these were connected with two small sub-outbreaks at area farms that totaled another nine cases. The direction of transmission may at times be difficult to trace, but quite often the school is either part of a chain of transmission involving work sites or households, or just an unfortunate bystander. The major theme I want to convey is that the virus is in our communities, and that is how it gets into our schools and workplaces, so we must always be cautious and careful. Now, this school did choose to go remote before their vacation, mainly because of staffing needs. As I've said many times, schools go remote for a variety of reasons, some public health related and some pragmatic and necessary, such as staffing issues brought about by the number of staff needing to either isolate or quarantine due to exposures. So even though we are sick of this pandemic, and even though many of us anxiously await a chance to get the vaccine, the virus is still a threat, and we need to stay focused on keeping it from spreading. Avoid gatherings and crowds, wear your mask, and if you have any reason to get tested, please do it. It's easy and it's free. I've discussed here the new testing opportunities we added in Bennington County after we started to see higher rates of COVID in that area. As part of these efforts, we also offered pop-up testing at local ski areas, Bromley and Stratton. The testing was offered to anyone who wanted it, whether employees, skiers, or even local residents. We now have data from this past weekend and though it is a very limited snapshot, I do want to emphasize that, I will share what we found. At Bromley, 148 people were tested through antigen testing, including a small number of staff. About 38% had a Vermont address, 62% were from outside of Vermont. Bromley was a great partner in this effort, and officials there said the overall response was very positive. We heard that several guests, after getting tested, went to get family and friends they were there with to get tested as well after learning it was free. At Stratton, through another great partner, Stratton Mountain Urgent Care, 79 people were tested through PCR testing. 
35% with a Vermont address, 65% out of state. Testing was also encouraged for staff and 180 people tested. Out of all of these experiences, only a total of three positives were found. Keep in mind, antigen results need to be confirmed with a PCR. Now, keep in mind, we don't want to draw final conclusions from one, one weekend's testing efforts with one self-selected sample. But I did want to provide this preliminary data, and we were glad to see that people were receptive to testing at ski areas and plan to offer testing again this weekend at both areas. We thank the resorts for working with us and supporting the communities in these efforts. As we continue to suppress uh, race to suppress the virus, we know that the emerging variants could make our work even harder. Our public health response won't change, but we do need to strengthen it, encourage better fitted masks, strict adherence to physical distancing, and keeping social contacts as few as possible. But these prevention steps we ask Vermonters to take are not the only tools at our disposal. We can ensure that our testing, tracing, and outbreak prevention and response strategies are robust, and that we can support people to isolate and quarantine when necessary. Vaccination also, of course, plays a role, as we really need to get out in front of these emerging variants as quickly as possible. The less the virus is able to be transmitted from person to person, the less the virus can mutate, and the less chance there is for a more virulent strain to uh, occur. And finally, policies are also another lever, such as the CDC's new order requiring masks on all public transportation. These can play a key role. You just heard Secretary Smith talk about the new guidance coming for long-term care facilities. I first want to emphasize and reinforce the very positive public health data from this sector as a great illustration of the potential for vaccination to markedly impact people's lives and lead us gradually into the future that we're all eagerly awaiting. These slides are updated from Tuesday's presentation. Uh, first, you can notice, of course, that we're having marked decreases in active cases. throughout the state of Vermont. And in the next slide, looking at our cohort of over 75 years old, a 75% decrease from mid-January. Keep in mind, vaccination began in this later part of December. And this is where we're seeing now a uh, significant effect. Note uh, here in terms of new cases and new vaccinations, the rolling seven days average. The yellow are the cases, the blue are the vaccinations. Vaccinations going up nicely at a very accelerated pace and the uh, case loads obviously coming down dramatically. And then finally, we are also noticing a marked impact on deaths over the same time period in our state. This is all deaths, but as we know, the majority of deaths are occurring in the older age ranges. Um, and you can see visually the dramatic impact. I just want to echo uh, some previous comments that we certainly recognize the toll separating residents from their loved ones has taken. We're glad vaccination efforts have been so successful in these facilities that it can help residents feel safe while making it possible to have greater freedoms in connection with others. Whether they're visiting with families, eating meals together, participating in group activities, we believe facilities can set a path forward and still maintain the safety standards we've all been dedicated to throughout the pandemic. The remarkably high uptake of vaccine is obviously able to work in the facility's favor. The other good news is that CMS regulatory language pivots off of the disease activity expressed as percent positivity rates in our counties. With rare exception, our facilities are free to be ambitious in implementing successive layers of freedom. The hope is that the aggressive posture that allowed us to protect people in these facilities 
can now just be as aggressively reversed to improve everyone's quality of life. But clearly, we will still guide the long-term care facility's use of the safest infection prevention and control practices and testing protocols. But imagine how differently a single positive case of COVID might impact such a facility in the post-vaccine era with such a high proportion of the residents protected. I have just one update on the vaccination front. Secretary Smith has already noted we're aiming to expand vaccination further to the 65 and older age groups soon. And as you know, the next age group beyond that will be people with high risk medical conditions. I can share that we are adding type one diabetes to the list of conditions that will be eligible for vaccine in this high risk group. It won't be viewed any differently than type two diabetes, which is already on the existing list. For my final comments, I wanna end on a note unrelated to COVID, but in the news. <clears throat> Several winter storms have left millions of homes and businesses without power across the country. And people have taken to using alternate power sources, such as gas generators or grills for cooking and heating their homes. This has led to a surge in carbon monoxide poisonings in places like Texas, as using these sources can lead to carbon monoxide buildup inside homes or garages. In Vermont, we may be more used to winter storms, but we can still face the same dangers. I'd hate for the message to get lost during the pandemic that we need to be cautious about carbon monoxide poisoning, a message we deliver traditionally several times over the course of a winter. It still turns out that dozens of Vermonters go to an emergency room each year for carbon monoxide related symptoms. So if you lose power, never run a generator, grill, camp stove, kerosene heater, or other fuel burning equipment indoors. Be sure to clear any snow away from vents of fuel burning equipment so they don't get blocked. Never leave a vehicle running inside a garage, even if the door is open. And make sure you have a carbon monoxide detector and alarm in your home. The symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning are headaches, dizziness, weakness, upset stomach, vomiting. These symptoms can be confused with the flu. Go outside immediately to get fresh air, then dial 911 if your carbon monoxide alarm goes off or you suspect carbon monoxide poisoning. Thank you. With that, we'll open up to questions. Let's start with Calvin. <clears throat> long-term care. So just a, a quick clarification. So um, these visitation policies, is this just for people within long-term care or if you have uh, you know, somebody that's in long-term care but their spouse is you know, living at home, can, can they still see each other? I guess I'm just looking for a little more clarification there. Sure, when we've sort of became more liberal in, in the recommendations. Uh, you know, obviously vaccination of the resident is, is one of those considerations that we put in. Uh, we're leaving it up to the long-term care facility to decide what the vaccination sort of requirements are for uh, individuals coming in to visit. But I would assume that they'll be pretty, if you're not vaccinated, I would assume that they're probably gonna allow visitation along that line. So if does that answer your question? So if you're, if you're an individual, you're a relative of somebody that's in a long-term care facility and you're not vaccinated, um, our expectation is you'll be allowed to visit. We'll be allowed, okay. Um, uh, regarding the, the winter storm Dr. Levine talked about, um, oh, actually, Secretary Smith, this is probably for you too. I'm wondering if we're, um, if, if we're going to see any of our vaccine allocations potentially delayed in the next few weeks as well. Uh, there have been you know, problems at airports and whatnot. We, we have not seen our vaccine, uh, vaccine delayed where it has impacted us. As you, I have previously mentioned, we, we have about a thousand doses in reserve that we use for this specific purpose that if there's a disruption in the supply line or if there's a need 
like a spoilage or something along that line that we can step in and not cancel clinics. We don't anticipate canceling any clinics right now because of the weather. And then just last question, um, you know, a few weeks ago you mentioned that you were in discussion with the NEA uh, about, you know, vaccine prioritization after the age banding. I guess I'm wondering, you know, if anything has come from those discussions yet or sort of an update on that. Yeah, I would describe them as cordial discussions. I think the um, leadership of the NEA and myself and, and the governor want the same thing, is that kids want to get back to school, parents want kids to get back to school on a five-day-a-week, full-time basis, and teachers. I mean, everybody wants the same thing. So we have the same objective. As the governor has mentioned, there is a phase six that we're anticipating right now and trying to figure out what we're going to do with phase six. Phase five is what the what Dr. Levine just talked about when he talked about di um, uh, type two and type one diabetes. Uh, those are with people with serious health conditions, underlying serious health conditions. We're still in discussions on what we're going to do with phase six. Um, but I can, I, I can say that uh, we're both looking for a path forward on where we're going to go with those vaccinations and, and having um, pleasant and positive discussions. Thanks. Steve? Yes, uh, this could be for the governor or Secretary French probably. Uh, uh, with the federal guidelines that have come out, uh, there was the, uh, the thought out there that uh, it may alter you're saying it's not going to alter the, um, the state's uh, guidelines, uh, but I believe the state's guidelines right now for all grades is three feet between desks, and I think the national is six, which is double that. So, you know, are there little tweaks that are going to be going on, or how's, how's that going to work? Again, I'll let <coughs> Secretary French answer this, but uh, those are just what they... They uh, reflect uh, guidelines, uh, and as uh, Secretary French had said, uh, they were mainly aimed at those who haven't opened up at all. We've been open up since the beginning. Uh, in fact, 30 percent uh, of our schools at this point in time are in person, I believe, four to five days a week. Um, and then we have about 20 percent who, who, which are remote. Uh, the rest, 50 percent, are uh, hybrid. So. We've already proven ourselves uh, in some respects, uh, and uh, we don't intend to change our guideline uh, at this point in time. But uh, Secretary French. Yeah, thanks, Governor. I, um, you know, just to reiterate uh, your point that, um, you know, we've had success with what we're doing. And just to clarify, we, um, we have three feet at grades K through six, but six feet in grades seven through 12. And uh, when we, we made that decision very early on based on, you know, what we're seeing internationally in, in the science, if you will, that younger students are uh, less susceptible to the virus or its transmission. So that stood us well. And once again, I think the other side of that is we have confidence uh, that what we're doing is working because we have uh, pretty substantial um, testing and particularly surveillance testing on a weekly basis in our school. So I think we'd know if it wasn't working well. Um, so we, we, I think, will remain uh, on our track that we are and monitor uh, our progress. But certainly, you know, as I mentioned, we welcome <clears throat> guidance like the CDC's. I mean, anything we can learn to improve our approach, we're definitely open to. So we'll, we'll continue to, um, you know, partner with, with folks at the national level to improve uh, what we've done and also to share what we've done because it, it stands, uh, you know, the other piece of the CD, CDC guidance that stands um, out that uh, many of the things we're doing are now incorporated in uh, the national guidance, which is good to see. And uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, and uh, as far as the um, the reopening, the turning of the spigot, um, where are we at now? I mean, the numbers are looking pretty good. Uh, businesses, some of the businesses are at 25 percent still. I think hairdressers and some other folks are. Uh, do we see a, a, another uh, little turn there at some point here? Yeah, again, I think the, the uh, announcement today is a huge change uh, in terms of travel. This is going to have um, a beneficial uh, effect on many. Uh, for those who are Vermonters who want to travel uh, to visit, let's say, go to Maine, uh, maybe do some snowmobiling or do whatever they want to do, they can travel and come back without quarantining. Um, so this is a, a, a big improvement and a, and a 
we're going to have to see how this works. We're going to work next week, as I said before, on uh, trusted households and, and further uh, refining what this means when you're vaccinated. So, but you can expect as we continue to see the numbers uh, re go in the, in the right way, as we're, we're experiencing right now, uh, that we'll continue to turn uh, this picket just a little bit more uh, every week, we hope. Well, that's, uh, along those lines is what I was talking about, the, uh, the planning process for a lot of these events that are going to be coming up as we get further into the year. Um, where are we at as far as that goes? I mean, yeah. uh, you know, the... Again, we'll pr provide uh, clarity as soon as we have um, some comfort as to where we're going. I mean, I mean there's still, uh, you know, I, again, positive developments in many respects, um, but, uh, but there are also... Uh, some areas that uh, give us a little bit of pause. We just want to make sure we're doing it for the right reasons uh, so we don't have to go backwards. We want to keep moving forward. And that's what we've done since the very beginning. Uh, it's, it's um, I believe, has, uh, has uh, uh, done well for us in some respects, and we'll continue to do that. Thank you. Stewart, NBC5. Good morning. Uh, in light of the bump in federal vaccine supplies coming into the state. I wonder if you have any sort of more insight. Um, you said that 65 plus will open the first week of March, week after next. Um, and then the those with the list of chronic medical conditions following that. When do you think the general population might uh, expect to become eligible? Well, again, we're going to consider that next phase after we finish with the health conditions uh, category, but that's a fairly significant population. Um, I, I'm guessing it's around 75,000 uh, at this point in time. So um, we have a little bit of time to determine where we go next, uh, but uh, you know, the age banding, uh, from my perspective, has worked very well. It's, uh, it's not confusing. Uh, people know where we're going, uh, and it's easy to administer. So, uh, again, we'll we'll you know weigh that all out uh, before we make an announcement on where we go next. But we want to get people through as quick as possible. I think Dr. Fauci had said uh, this past week <clears throat> that we might be able to have um, most of the population done uh, midsummer. So I think. We're falling in line with that, and uh, we're hopeful. We continue to build on the supply and what we're seeing with it from the manufacturers, increasing their their inventory and, and supply and getting them out to the states is positive news, and we'll continue to work with the federal government to make sure that we receive our share. Okay. Let me ask you a political question, second, uh, Governor. Um, a young man named Colby LaMarche. Uh, resigned his position as chairman of the Burlington uh, Republican Party and from the Vermont Republican Party last night. And in a letter uh, that has been made public, uh, uh, decried uh, what he called the unfortunate truth that the Vermont GOP has now been hijacked by far-right extremists who have attached themselves to uh, what he called the extremist former president. Uh, and so he felt he has no chance but to leave and said the party is headed for electoral disaster as a result. Do you agree with him? Have you spoken with him? Is this sort of the way you see things as well? Um, I have not spoke, uh, spoken with him. I, I read that account. Um, I think it's unfortunate. You know, a, a younger person involved in the Republican Party is uh, good news. Um, and I appreciated uh, all his good work. Um, what we see, you know, whether it's a Democrat or Republican, uh, you know, you see the the extremes of both uh, both groups uh, at the at the party level and and beyond, and some of their voices are, are very loud. Uh, but I still believe uh, the vast majority of Vermonters on both sides of the aisle uh, are in the majority. I think it's that that centrist, uh, moderate <laughs> voice uh, that uh, a lot of us uh, will will react to, and um, and that's where I see us going in the future. But um, but again, uh, acknowledging that those voices are loud, and uh, and from his perspective, uh, he didn't feel he had a, a role to play. But I'm hoping uh, in time that he'll be able to come back. Thank you. Sean, the Chester Telegraph. 
Thank you. I think this is for uh, Secretary Smith. Um, we're hearing stories about some geographic problems in scheduling vaccine appointments here in southern Vermont. Uh, for example, we heard from an 80-year-old from the Chester area who was scheduled in Montpelier, which is a 200-mile uh, round trip. Also, uh, someone who was scheduled from, who wanted to go to Springfield and ended up in Windsor. And at the same time, we're also hearing that there have been people from Chittenden County who've been scheduled in Windsor County. Um, a lot of people are saying that the people at the call center don't seem to understand the geography of Vermont. Are you hearing these stories, and is there a plan to fix this before opening up to larger numbers? And also, um, are there plans for more clinics opening in the southern part of the state? Yeah, thanks, Sean. I, I have not heard of those complaints. I mean, if you're online, you choose your own location. Uh, if you're calling into the call center, we do have Vermonters uh, that are manning those those um, uh, those call centers. Not, uh, you know, we have also um, Maximus, which is uh, what we use for uh, Medicaid as well, uh, manning some of the call center uh, the call center as well. But we do have Vermonters um, that are also doing that. But I'll, Sean, I'll look into that. I have not heard. Uh, you know, I've heard of a, a few instances, but not sort of an overwhelming um, complaints that people are having problems finding vaccination sites near to their facility. And if we, if we uh, have an issue, I will straighten it out. Thank you. Governor, today's reopening of travel raises questions about what will be the state's response to people who decline vaccination. Yesterday, a bill was introduced to prohibit loss of employment, educational access, and travel for non-vaccinated people. Will the state allow employers and schools to require vaccination for employees and students? You know, it's a, it's a great question, Guy. I think I said probably a month or two ago at one of these uh, media events that this was going to be a dialogue we we're going to have to have both on the state level and the national level what this means to us and um, and I would just say uh, that we 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 have to have the conversation uh, from what we announced today I think it's quite clear uh, you have to be vaccinated in order to not quarantine when you're coming back in the in the state uh, it doesn't mean that you can't leave and come back, but you have to quarantine once you do if you're not fully vaccinated. So, uh, but again, these uh, these questions are, are you know topical, and uh, and I believe they have to be um, discussed. Uh, but I'm not familiar with the bill that you referenced. Okay, thank you. Um, two years ago, the state of Vermont replaced in full the Title X fund family planning funding lost by Planned Parenthood when the Trump administration said abortion providers no longer qualify. If, as seems likely, the Biden administration restores Title X funding, will you recommend the legislature remove the estimated, I think it's about 800,000 in state funding? Um, again, if, they are, if the federal government is going to provide funding, uh, then we would take advantage of that uh, so that we didn't have to uh, utilize state money. Thank you. Liz, Burlington Free Press. Hi there. Um, my first question is a clarification question for Secretary Smith on the um, long-term care facility guidance. You said that one of the um, factors that should be considered is whether, whether the facility had an outbreak or not. And I wonder if you were referring to like having a current outbreak or an outbreak at all during the pandemic. I'm thinking of like a facility like Burlington Health and Rehab who had their outbreak back in like March 2020. Um, would they be ineligible for these uh, uh, reopening? No, it's a, it, it is a current outbreak, an ongoing outbreak, not something that's happened previously. Okay, thank you. And um, I'm not sure who this question is for, but we had a reader write in. Um, he is 63 and has uh, chronic conditions. And he's wondering if there's been any updated guidance as 
to, um, you know, when his when his bracket comes eligible for um, vaccination, whether he will have to prove um, that he has those conditions, and if so, how. Yeah, we're, we we I just announced that uh, the first week of March we're doing um, 65 and up for an age ban. The next uh, band will be those with underlying conditions, with serious underlying conditions. Um, there will be a verification process in that. It will be in the drop-down menu in terms of uh, you will have to self-attest and then there'll be a verification process from there. We'll outline that um, as soon as we have the IT uh, program all put together, which is in progress right now. So that can give you some indication that we're coming up on to this age band um, next month in a fairly rapid way. So I would just ask your reader to uh, stay tuned. It will be self-evident once they uh, sign on, either through the phone system or through the um, uh, or through on-site. But there will be a verification process. It will be, okay, by the way, by, by the way, it will be fairly, um, it will not be intrusive to the person that's signing up. There's a lot of things that will happen behind the scenes on the verification. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Rebecca. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, First question, and this may go to Mike Smith or maybe the commissioner, uh, Dr. Levine. Uh, first question centers <clears throat> on the COVID traces found in the wastewater system dumped by the city of Burlington into Lake Champlain. I've yet to see any public discussion about the impact that those COVID strains might have on drinking water for those communities up and down Lake Champlain, both in Vermont and New York State, as obviously the primary source for their drinking, cooking, cleaning, water, whatever. What is the state doing to help each town or water district make sure its water is safe for Vermonters to use? <clears throat> Mike, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't want you to differentiate the variant strain from the regular, we'll call it the regular strain. Uh, because it's all virus either way. And so the assumption that's been made is that it doesn't really matter what strain of the virus or what virus for that matter, um, the water treatment plants are still operating the same way they always operate. So I don't think people should be fearful of um, getting the variant strain of coronavirus from drinking the water any more than they should be fearful of getting any strain of coronavirus that currently exists from drinking the water. Granted, I, I, you know, maybe I made it too specific, but what are they doing to make sure that the water is acceptable? Right. I mean, I, my understanding is nothing during the pandemic has changed from their normal uh, chlorination and other processes that they would use uh, because in the end um, that is virucidal if you will uh, no matter what the virus okay and uh, maybe for you or uh, Secretary French I'm wondering what you know about the new outbreak in the South Carolina school system we continue to be asked also why the state continues to ignore teachers in the list of those getting shots. Most states have made teachers priorities in getting schools fully reopened. Uh, I think you, somebody mentioned, I think Mike Smith may have, I didn't hear Calvin's question, but you know, some see this as especially troublesome that teachers are taking a back seat, especially at least one hospital allowed its lawyers and others in risk management that have no contact with patients to get private shots. but. You know, I get to see a target date for teachers that are out on the front lines and certainly probably goes to the same for grocery stores. They can't get shot, but those are working in pharmacies can. Um, so what have you heard about South Bureau and when, when can teachers 
is there a date certain that you're shooting for? Yeah, I have no special insights on South Hero. I'll leave that to Secretary French if he has any knowledge on that. And I believe both the governor and Secretary Smith have pretty uh, exhaustively answered your question uh, regarding the discussions that are going on and the things that are on the table and the mutual progress people want to make towards getting to an agreed upon goal. Uh, but I'll let Secretary French uh, but I haven't speak heard for it, himself. But I, but I haven't heard a date. I mean, they're talking down the line, but everybody's going to get it down the line. Is there a date, a target date for teachers? Hey Mike, this is uh, Mike Smith. We, we had mentioned that we're looking at phase six, which is um, if you were sort of mapping this out, I think you would see 65 and older on Mar uh, the first week of March. I would think you would see the start of the, um, the aspect of those with underlying conditions about mid-March. And then we'll start looking at phase six, which we've been having discussions with um, the heads of the teachers union on that specific phase and what we're, what we're going to do. There's no time frame. There is something that's going on that will be coming out uh, next week that I've already talked with the, um, the head of the NEA on, and that, that is we're going to be sending out a survey to uh, teachers um, and school personnel and childcare to make sure that we have an accurate number of what our needs are going to be for vaccines for those groups. There's no promises here, but um, we're looking at those groups in terms of uh, what, what we need to do for planning. So if I was adding all those up, I would say that it's, uh, it's coming, but I don't have a specific date for you. And Mike, okay. just to and follow up. Yeah, I don't have any specific information on South Hero either. Uh, have you been told about it, Eva? Uh, just in sort of our generic reporting, but um, I don't have any specific information. I mean, when will you get an update on the outbreak? I generally don't have uh, updates on specific circumstances like that. We just look at the, the general data. Periodically, I do have superintendents or principals uh, make me aware of their situation, particularly if it's uh, complex from an operational standpoint. Um, but generally speaking, um, I don't get an email or a call from every principal anytime they have a case in their school. I do see the aggregated data through our reporting system. But when they shut down a whole school, you aren't notified? Not necessarily. Really? Okay. Thank you. Greg, the County Courier. Thank you, Governor. Uh, good afternoon. Go uh, thank you, Rebecca. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, first off, I wanted to thank, thank you for getting me the list of outbreaks in Vermont. Um, I, I noticed on that list, I see a school that have first identified an outbreak on February 5th. And yet seven days later, they hosted a varsity basketball game. Obviously the state hasn't been transparent to people to, to let them know that, you know, each, each, each uh, school has identified a new outbreak. But I'm, I'm wondering as far as participants at that game, is the, uh, is the hosting school notifying the, the visiting school uh, that they've had an outbreak and, is that visiting school notifying parents that they're uh, busing their kids to a school that's had an outbreak? Here, here's what I do know, and I'll let uh, Secretary French add to this, but uh, if, if there's an outbreak that shuts a school down um, then and they go remote, uh, then there is no athletics at that school either. Um, Secretary French? Yeah, I, firstly, I would just say, you know, outbreak, uh, this word, we don't, we haven't seen necessarily outbreaks at school. We've seen cases and situations, but not necessarily outbreaks. But um, when the cases are identified, we do, um, you know, sort of go, the FE team goes through their typical contact tracing process and so forth and advises the, the school on, on what to do next. Uh, there have been situations where um, that process has impacted uh, the operations of a school or related schools because of the ne necessity of people to quarantine or isolate and so forth. But in those circumstances aren't directly connected to the ability to offer uh, a, a game or to hold a game. 
So there have been situations where um, a school has um, shut down part of its operation due to uh, logistical concerns, not necessarily directly related to the virus, but still held athletic competition. So, you know, again, just to give you a sense of the nuance involved, those things are evaluated very closely and school districts are, are given specific advice uh, on their situation. It might be helpful as well if I had Dr. Levine um, explain what an outbreak is, um, because it's not, uh, it's in some cases, not as dramatic as it might uh, appear. Thank you, Governor. In fact, in most cases, it's not as dramatic as it might appear. It is an epidemiologic definition that has to do with the setting that the cases are in and the epidemiologic linkages amongst cases. And in some settings, two cases constitutes an outbreak. And uh, Greg, uh, you probably noticed on the list that we sent to you, uh, there are a number of situations that are listed as worksite A or worksite B and don't have a number of cases assigned to them because again, they are so small a number uh, that they would be identifying otherwise. So um, the school situation is such that you can have three individuals in a school and have an outbreak, yet that is the limitation of the entire number of cases there. And in fact, minimal, if any, number of people might even have to have quarantined because of those three cases, depending upon the circumstances. Um, so quite often, that does not result in a closing of any classroom or school at all, or a going to remote learning, which would, as the governor just indicated, immediately uh, force the school to cancel all of its athletic competitions. Uh, so that is the way it's sort of put together. So I would doubt that there was a school that had an outbreak that closed it and put it into remote and then played sports the next day uh, because that would be directly uh, in contradiction to all of the guidance that we provided all along. I, I still don't think I got an answer, though, as far as are parents notified if their kids are uh, being bused to another school that has very recently had an identified outbreak. Yeah, I don't believe. I, I would just. I, I don't believe ahead. that's uh, done by uh, any requirement or any existing guidance. Obviously, everyone at the school itself knows because the uh, school staff are really very good about conveying that information through their community to all of the parents and families. But again, it'd be again like if you knew about a work site that had a case, but the, they were still open for business, you could elect to boycott them and never go to them, or you could understand that because they had one case that was acquired in the community that's now been removed from the work site, that the Worksite is, in fact, quite safe, and everybody has been questioned, and everybody understands if they are a close contact or not. Probably safer than the place where you don't know that there's a case that's there, and nobody's been questioned, so nobody's thought about it. So again, you have to use this information very, very uh, delicately, if I could use that word, because quite often, um, no one is at risk, and if people were at risk, that process has already been gone through where we've notified everyone who's at risk. Certainly, okay. Uh, moving on to my second question here because I, I don't want to take too much time. Um, Governor, is it your intent with the uh, current travel policy to continue to require fully vaccinated people to quarantine for seven days and, and get a test? Or does being fully vaccinated free someone from that part of the executive order? I'm, I guess I'm not understanding the question. I think, think what I announced today would, would do just that. If you are fully vaccinated, fully vaccinated, first, second dose in two weeks, you can travel without quarantine. And if you come in contact with someone who is, uh, is uh, infected, you don't have to quarantine either. Thank you for that clarification. Okay. My, my reception was a little bit broken, I think, when you announced for that. So okay. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Governor. Thank you, staff. Have a great weekend. Devin, Local 22.
Yeah, my question uh, is about a store in Newport. UPS severed its relationship with it because they refused to comply uh, with the mask order. Um, they had warned them, or the attorney general had sent them a letter back in November, and then another one on Wednesday, the store uh, ultimately ended its relationship. They had a sign posted on their door that said, we choose not to wear a mask if you're uncomfortable with this. We ask that you do not come in. Um, what is your reaction, uh, Governor Scott, to sort of the messaging that this store was putting out, um, saying that they're choosing not to wear a mask despite the mandate? Um, this seems to be an issue that's been pretty few and far between in Vermont, but something that uh, has been kind of a hot-button topic nationally. What's your reaction to that? Yeah, this was in direct violation of the guidelines that we put into place. Uh, that's why uh, the Attorney General was involved. Uh, we did see this on social media. We looked into it, uh, tried to to repair the problem, tried to give guidance, and uh, the guidance wasn't accepted. And it appears the uh, corporate UPS uh, decided to get involved themselves and and, and actually appears uh, took away their, their franchise. Uh, the unfortunate part from all of this is it was avoidable. Uh, if they just complied with the, the guidelines we put into place and as the uh, UPS corporate had, uh, had asked as well, uh, they'd be open today. And I'm hoping, um, and again, this is out of my control, it's, they were in violation of their franchise agreement with uh, corporate UPS, but it'd be my hope that they could find a path forward to reopen following our guidance. We don't want to shut any businesses down. All right, thank you. Lisa, the AP. Thank you. Um, when we get to that group of, of um, Vermonters with chronic underlying medical conditions, will you be further breaking that group down by age group or is, it, or is the entire group um, will they be all eligible at the same time to sign up and get vaccine? Yeah, we're considering all of that and um, we'll have more details on that in the very near future uh, long before they're able to sign up, but uh, we're considering all that. We just want a seamless uh, process uh, that's easily understood and gets us to the end as quick as possible. Okay, thank you. Hi, got another question about the long-term care facility guidance changes. Just wanted to absolutely clarify for a viewer who wrote in and was confused. People from outside facilities are, if they are fully vaccinated, are now allowed to come into the facilities if that facility allows it, correct? Kat, if the facility allows it, you don't have to be vaccinated to come into the facility. I think uh, Calvin asked a similar question that what we are saying is that because the person inside the facility is vaccinated. Now, it can be one of the criteria, but I would suspect most will just keep in, uh, you know, we have the resident vaccinated and visitation policies, indoor visitation policies, I think, will remain um, that we won't require people uh, coming in to be vaccinated. Got it. I wanted to clarify because we did get a couple of emails after the questions were asked earlier wanting us to clarify that. Okay. And the next question I had on that front was, how, what is the way that the, um, the state is going to be advising these facilities on what's the appropriate way to gauge the safety of certain measures that they roll out? Are you going to be giving them specific, like, here's yes. what we recommend you do? Or is it the type of thing where each facility gets to, you know, have a pretty broad um, leeway with what they choose to have as their policy. There are two ways that we're going to be doing this. One, you know, the skilled nursing facilities have to uh, still appear, adhere to the CMS guidelines, and we've sort of worked around those guidelines, not worked around, worked in conjunction with those guidelines in order to uh, be specific. We're going to re be releasing a whole set of guidelines for all um, long-term care facilities. <laughs> Uh, in that, we're going to be holding um, uh, discussions with those long-term care facilities to make sure that we answer every single question that they have. And I think that's going to happen next week as we, uh, as we roll out these, uh, these guidelines. 
And will those be online so that people who are curious can go see them? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to make sure that they're online, Kat, so that it, anybody can see them. Thank you very much. Aaron, BT Digger. Um, the Vermont Supreme Court upholding the constitutional, uh, constitutionality of the state law on gun control. I don't, I don't know if I got the whole question. Do you have any thoughts on the Vermont Supreme Court upholding the state law that bans high capacity gun magazines? Oh, the, I, I hadn't heard that actually, Aaron. So, oh. <laughs> um, it, okay. That is yeah, a, I guess it is yeah. a relatively recent. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that doesn't surprise um, me. We thought it was constitutional from the start, but it uh, doesn't surprise me that they found it so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to kind of clarify, the court wrote an issue uh, issued ruling uh, today. We conclude that ma the magazine ban is a reasonable regulation of the right of the people to bear arms for self defense. Um, this is the law that you signed in April 2018 in response to the alleged school shooting or after the alleged school shooting plot in Fairhaven. Yeah, again, I'm any additional thoughts from that or? Yeah, unfortunately, Aaron, I didn't hear all of that once again. But, uh, uh, but I, uh, we, um, you know, I support anyone uh, challenging the constitution, um, constitutionality of any a law that we might put into place. I think it's fully within their rights. They did so, and uh, the Supreme Court appears to have uh, upheld that. So again, we thought it was constitutional from the beginning, and uh, the Supreme Court appears to have agreed with us. So. Um, Again, I, but I support anyone's right to uh, to at least challenge that. Okay, thank you. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Hey, good afternoon, Governor. I have a, a general economic question for you, and I was wondering after uh, Commissioner Harrington can update us on when the good 1099Gs will be going out. But as far as the economy is going, you know, the revenue report uh, was, was pretty good that came out uh, earlier this week especially on the personal income tax. That looks pretty good. Uh, the ski areas, look, they, they're having um, really a surprisingly good uh, season. The snow has been phenomenal. Um, cases have been low. And um, so I'm wondering, and the, the national economy seems to be softening. I'm wondering if what your take is on the Vermont economy now, uh, given sort of early results. Well, again, I, I'm, I would go back to... Um, while our economy has improved over the last uh, number of years, three or four years, uh, as reflected in some of our budget and the surpluses we've seen and, and so forth, um, it, isn't as, it still isn't as good as it should be. Uh, that's why we put in a lot of the measures in place. We want to grow our economy. We want to make Vermont more affordable. And we put a lot of uh, uh, issues forward uh, that uh, the legislature has agreed to and uh, come up with some on their own as well. So we work together to improve the economy. It's got a long ways to go. But if you're comparing to what uh, we had before to what other states might have had before that had a stronger economies, theirs has probably softened. Ours has improved. Um, and I, th I believe uh, that we, if we do things right, and, and especially with some of the, the surplus funds we find ourselves with, uh, the one-time money, a couple hundred million dollars, if we invest those in the right areas, I think we can have an even uh, much more improved economy, a stronger economy uh, in the end. So uh, that's why we're working so hard uh, to try and identify those, those areas where we make those investments with one-time money uh, to make strategic uh, decisions about improving our economy in the future. I was kind of thinking of uh, just anecdotally, this, this moment in time, how are, how are you feeling about the, the local economy? Um, Again, I, uh, I, it's, it's much better than I thought it was going Sound to be. Sound reluctant. Yeah. Well, no, I'm hesitant because uh, it's supported uh, by an influx of federal money. Um, so this is a, you know, we're in, we're in good shape today, um, but this isn't a real solid foundation. This is built on billions of dollars of injected federal money uh, into our economy that's helped us. 
uh, the, the trick is uh, to make sure that we come out of this when the, the federal money's gone so that we can support ourselves, stand on our own two feet. Uh, so these strategic investments I've been talking about are vitally important to being able to accomplish that in the future. Okay, great, thanks. If, if Commissioner Harrington has an update on the 1099, that'd be great. Hi, uh, thank you, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to share the information. Uh, right now, we're still on track to have the new uh, 1099 uh, mailed out uh, by the end of the month. Uh, our extension uh, that we requested um, runs out uh, the first week in March, so we should be able to get the 1099s out before our extension expires. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Derek, seven days. Hi, uh, my first question is for uh, Secretary Smith. Uh, I'm wondering if these forthcoming long-term care guidelines will require or recommend that a home have a certain proportion of its staff vaccinated before uh, they relax these visitation uh, restrictions. And, and I ask that knowing that we've seen how outbreaks among staff at these homes have created critical shortages that can affect the quality of care. Yeah, we, we have, we're still maintaining the regimen of the pretty um, uh, rigorous regimen of testing uh, in long-term care, care facilities. And we've had great response in terms of uh, those staff that have uh, gotten vaccination. Um, we, in our guidance, we aren't requiring vaccination. Um, it's going to be an individual choice, but uh, that is staff and residents. Now, like I said, we've had tremendous uh, uptake on uh, on the vaccination, and and I think it will continue as we uh, as we move forward. But we have not required that they uh, that they be vaccinated. That's an individual choice. Okay, and so the so the guidelines won't won't say, you know, the state recommends two thirds of your staff be vaccinated before you do X, Y, or Z. No, we recommend that you be vaccinated. We're not, yep. we're, we're not putting any criteria yep. on that. Uh, as I said, three fourths, of, three fourths of the staff have been vaccinated. I think I said three fourths of the staff have been vaccinated and, and uh, we'll, we'll go, yeah, uh, nearly uh, three fourths of the staff have completed their first dose and half the staff have completed their second dose. Great. My other question is uh, uh, related to the new travel rules uh, for folks who are vaccinated. Is, is that going to be um, an honor system to prove that you are vaccinated or is the state issue any sort of proof of vaccination card that people could carry with them? There, there is a vaccination card. All states should have this. It's mm -hmm. uh, federally issued, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. And I may ask uh, Dr. Levine to, to explain further, but everyone should have the card with them whenever they travel in or out of the state and be prepared to show it when asked. All right, that's all I have then, thank you. Greg, Greg the Bennington Banner. Uh, hello, Governor, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, on Wednesday, uh, lawmakers who gathered for a news conference on opiate overdose deaths in Vermont said that COVID relief daughter, dollars ought to be used for addiction treatment because the pandemic has contributed to the increased number of relapses, overdoses, and deaths in the state. Would you support the use of upcoming COVID relief dollars uh, for opiate treatment and counseling? Well, we'll certainly reflect on that. Uh, we know we have our challenges in terms of the opioid crisis. The pandemic has had um, a bit of a, a detrimental effect on that, and uh, we're concerned. Uh, we have a, we've now uh, put into place a, pre, uh, a chief prevention officer uh, in, uh, in our staff. Uh, it was uh, former Commissioner Monica Hutt is now uh, on the uh, fifth floor with us and as our liaison. And uh, as well, I've spoken to Secretary Smith about upping our efforts uh, in this regard to get back on track to get the treatment that uh, that we need. Uh, Secretary Smith. Thank you, Governor. We, um, we've recognized that the pandemic has isolated people and in those isolated cases, 
Um, we've not had the results that we want in terms of op opioid deaths. We have, you know, we did a really good job up until when the pandemic hit. We were all tre we were trending in all the right directions into that, and then the pandemic hit. And the biggest factor, I think, is isolation. It, we've put into place various ways of people connecting with us. Um, uh, Commissioner Squirrel from the Department of Mental Health talked about a couple of those, but we are putting together a task force within the agency and coordinating with, um, with the Chief Prevention Officer, Monica Hutt, in order to make it a statewide effort in, t in order to redouble our efforts in, in this area. Um, we can't lose ground, no matter pandemic or not into this and we need to uh, address this uh, this situation as we move forward. Dr. Levine, do you have anything or did you? Okay. As Secretary Smith said, you know, there'd been probably a five or six year continued growth in opioid overdose deaths and then uh, the year before the pandemic, we had a dramatic decline actually. Um, that coincided with a lot of successful programming. Uh, all of that programming has gone on, and as uh, Secretary Smith has just said, the root cause is really the isolation produced by the pandemic. The fact that people, first of all, vulnerable individuals who are already uh, in the thralls of substance misuse were confronted with a pandemic and the extra stress that that could provide potentially uh, uh, increasing their use. Secondly, the fact that being alone, they had no one to rescue them if they overdosed, so that there was a uh, lack of a structure with friends who would look out for each other because they were isolated. And then thirdly, amongst many other reasons, the fact that their usual supply chains were disrupted and they often did not know what was in the product that they were purchasing. So all of those things contributed to the reversal of the good fortune we'd had the year before. But I don't want people to think that nothing else was going on because uh, we've been really pioneers in the rapid access to MAT program. And during the course of the pandemic, we've actually expanded the number of hospitals that now can provide immediate access to buprenorphine uh, for those who are agreeable and want to take that at that time. We've also uh, expanded the number of syringe service programs that are poised to provide MAT to their clientele uh, through that mechanism. And they have a, a fairly robust clientele that uh, connect with them and are trusting of them and when they are prepared to take MAT and start buprenorphine, uh, they now have a ready avenue to do that. And I don't want people to think that the substance misuse treatment system shut down because of the pandemic. Uh, those who went to our hubs uh, continued to go to our hubs, and in fact, were able to go to the hubs in a more uh, um, relaxed way, if you will, uh, not having the requirement for the intensity of their visits to the hub. They could have take-home doses, things of that sort, that would allow them to, again, protect themselves in a pandemic, but still be on the appropriate treatment. Those who went to spokes didn't always have to have face-to-face -face contact with their clinicians. They were able to actually um, get provided their monthly buprenorphine prescriptions without having to travel and, again, be in face-to-face -face contact. And those systems have continued and are actually enrolling more and more people all of the time. So it is a tragedy that we have had a pandemic and that uh, the fortunes that we'd enjoyed for a year were reversed so quickly. But I don't want people to think that um, all systems shut down. Uh, this system has continued to go on and there's a lot of dedicated people who either in person or remotely were delivering services through the treatment centers, through the recovery centers, et cetera. Okay, I had three people answering my question, so I don't think I can really ask for more. Thank you very much. Avery, WCAX. 
My question is likely for my first question is likely for Dr. Levine. We were forwarded a letter from a UVM parent that said that the UK variant has been found on the campus, but we were confused as to whether that meant in the wastewater in Burlington or whether it was discovered with a uh, test of, of a person. Yeah, if that letter is correct, that that parent has way more insight into situations than the entire campus administrative community and the state of Vermont. Um, and must have just sequenced something on their own. All we have is the two mutations that were found in the wastewater. None of the subsequent genome sequencing specimens have shown the variant, but I will uh, say we still have more to test. And uh, three days from now, we're going to get more results back, and we'll see what they show. Um, so it's still pending. I, I would not want anyone to say with certainty that uh, we found in the nasal secretions of somebody the variant virus, and that was proven by genome sequencing. Okay. My other question is uh, likely for Secretary Curley. We've been receiving a lot of messages and emails from people who are part of social clubs like St. John's Club concerned about why they are not allowed to open, but restaurants who serve food are allowed to open, whereas they, at social clubs they also serve food. Is there any guidance that the state can provide for these types of social clubs? Secretary Curley, are you on? I sure am. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, we do have guidance for social clubs to operate. Um, if they are able to operate as a restaurant, they need to follow the restaurant guidance on our workspace, uh, in our workspace on our webpage at accd.vermont.gov. Um, they also could operate uh, under a section for indoor entertainment if they wanted to um, host a, a bingo, for example. They could also have a blood drive or be a vaccination site. So there's a variety of ways that they can operate. Um, currently, they are unable to operate in the traditional club setting, social club setting, due to our multi-household gathering prohibition. But there are a variety of ways that they can operate during this time. Thank you. John, BPR. Thank you. Uh, I saw a headline this morning in the New York Times where uh, it says states are finding hidden stashes of the coronavirus vaccine. Um, and these were supplies that were set aside for nursing homes, um, and now um, and haven't been used, and they're trying to, many states are trying to, to get that uh, in order to boost their own vaccine efforts. And I'm wondering, is that a situation that we have here in Vermont? Are, are we finding hidden stashes? Yeah, I don't know if I'd... Uh... I, I don't know if I I don't know if I would describe them as hidden stashes, but uh, we are finding uh, there is some inventory that we are going to uh, bring back into the fold and put into use. I'll let Secretary Smith talk about that. John, we've found through the long-term care, the federal long-term care program, that there has been um, doses that have been left over. Um, we are we've collected uh, 2,800 doses from. Uh, CVS, and we're in the process of, of, of getting back uh, 7,000 uh, doses, those are first and second doses, from Walgreens that haven't been used. As you know, we used our allocation to give them um, portions of our allocation up front in the beginning of the 1A uh, phase. Now we're starting to recapture those doses back into our systems. And uh, we've received the, the 2,800 and have immediately redeployed that. And we are uh, looking at getting the 7,000 first and second dose back and redeploying that as well. And so uh, these doses are now, um, are you figuring them into your calculation of, of sort of the time frame for the next age band, et cetera? Does, does it allow you to move things up a little bit, or has it allowed you? Yeah, we, we got to be a little bit careful with that, John, uh, because it's one time. It's a one-time bump. Uh, yeah. So we're, we're figuring it into our calculations in terms of our age banding, but at the same time, we're looking at a more sustainable 
uh, flow that's coming in as we as we move forward. I think, um, the, you know, next week it's like 13,000 uh, doses. Don't it, it's just it's over 13,000, but I don't have the precise number with me. Okay, um, and then under the new. Uh, policy that if you're quarantined, um, I'm, I'm sorry, if you've been vaccinated, you don't have to quarantine if you've, if you've been out of state. Um, but would folks still have to uh, or still be unable to visit uh, other households, other families? Um, I know you're, you're addressing that later on, but they could, folks could be vaccinated but still be unable to meet with friends and family that's, that's, uh, that's, here. That's, that's Let's correct. Come back. Yeah, that's correct, at least for the time being. And that's exactly what I was talking about. It raises a lot of questions, the what ifs, the what abouts. And uh, we're going to address those next week. Uh, the travel policy goes into effect on Tuesday. Hopefully, we'll have a lot of these worked out uh, Tuesday or Friday and uh, be able to answer those questions. But that's exactly uh, what I was uh, talking about, that um, it, it will lead some to, uh, to reflect on, well, why not this? And uh, we just can't answer that right now. Mm -hmm. We want people to focus on is your ability uh, to travel in and out of the state uh, without quarantining if you've been fully vaccinated uh, plus two weeks. Uh, and then we'll, we'll consider all the other questions that might come along. And I'm sure that we'll, we'll get uh, a number of them over the next few days. But, but this is why we want to take our time, make sure we get it right uh, so that we can clearly define what we're doing. Thank you very much. Um, as well, I'd like to go back uh, just for the the inventory that was uh, found in some of the the pharmacies and so forth. As you might remember, this was an area of concern uh, for me. Uh, I think it was Tuesday when we heard that the or I heard uh, from uh, the Biden administration that they were going to double the amount of uh, vaccines for pharmacies and long-term care facilities. And I'm very concerned uh, about um, the federal government getting involved in some of the uh, the contracts that they want to 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 do and utilize, uh, we would like to have more control over our vaccination plan uh, because these types of situations wouldn't happen if we had the control of the supply coming into the funneling into the state. We want to have partnerships. We want to work with the pharmacies and the FQHCs. Uh, but we'd like to know where that where that vaccine's going and how much they have and make sure that we're utilizing it to our full, fullest advantage. So this is one area that uh, the, the governors, uh, myself, the governors uh, across uh, the country, both sides of the aisle, uh, are, are raising a red flag here um, because this could, uh, this could be problematic uh, for us uh, as we try and distribute as much as we can, as fast as we can. Thanks. Um, hello. I don't know whether this is a topical question or not, but um, when there was the conversation about antigen testing earlier, um, it occurred to me that uh, someone who's been vaccinated might show up as positive on that. I, I could be wrong about it. But if that is the case, can the antigen test be used over time to... Um, monitor the uh, length of time that uh, a, va uh, a vaccine remains effective. Dr. Levine. <clears throat> I'm going to have to sort of self-interpret your question, Joe, but let's say a person's been uh, newly vaccinated in a two-dose vaccine and they've gotten the first dose. There is a possibility that person in the next week or two can actually contract COVID and test positive on any test, a PCR test, an antigen test, you name it, um, because they're in the period of time where their own immune response hasn't yet gotten to the point where it would be totally protective. And we have seen that um, in a, just a very, very small number of people in Vermont and certainly a greater number of people around the country. Um, so the, the test is still the test. And if there's 
enough viable uh, virus in someone's nose, then the quantity is there, um, the test can detect it. The goal is that once your immune system has really done what it's supposed to do in response to the vaccine, that you can repeatedly use an antigen test on somebody in their nose and not find any virus. If we believe the AstraZeneca data, <clears throat> two-thirds of the people in their trial um, did not have any virus detectable on testing after vaccine. And that <clears throat> tells us a lot about how much you might be able or not be able to transmit the virus to someone else if you've been vaccinated. The UK is now doing a study where they're actually um, subjecting someone in the study to uh, getting the virus, uh, by having them breathe it in, um, and looking at the same question with regards to vaccination. And they've been able to um, get that through their ethics apparatus, and um, we'll see what kind of results they get from that. If you're asking six months from now, after somebody's been vaccinated, could you keep using an antigen test to see if they you know, still remain immune, probably wouldn't be a great use of that test at that time unless they had symptoms. I wouldn't just do it in a surveillance way. <clears throat> and if, on the other hand, you're talking about antibody tests, those are you know, blood tests as opposed to the swab in your nose. Um, Certainly any body tests would be able to detect if you have some level of immunity, but nobody really has done the studies yet to see uh, if it's worth looking at a population-wide basis, um, blood samples from people over time. I'm sure those are gonna be done as part of some of the trials, but we don't have any real insight into that just yet. So I hope with that sort of lengthy answer, I covered what you wanted me to. I think you did. Um, I obviously had uh, a misunderstanding about antigen and antibody tests, um, but you think that the continuing studies uh, that allowed the uh, emergency use authorization will do the kind of work that in the end will show how long a vaccine is effective for. Yeah, I, I do, and I, I really think that's a critical question. So um, we, we need answers to that. Obviously, it brings up all kinds of issues about boosters and things of that sort. Um, so we need those answers, and those will be forthcoming. I can tell you, though, right now, nobody is doing routine antibody testing after vaccination in the immediate period. So you get your dose, or you get your two doses, depending on which vaccine. Uh, there's no requirement or intent that you get an antibody test to check on what happened or didn't happen. Uh, we will assume you are vaccinated and that you hopefully have a higher level of immunity to the SARS-CoV-2 virus than you did before the vaccine. Thank you, that's very clear. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I believe both my questions are for Mike Smith. Um, if someone is vaccinated, is eligible to get the vaccine and they move to Vermont, what constitutes residency? Uh, does someone have to be a resident for a certain amount of time before they are eligible to get the vaccine? How is residency verified? We have two cri criteria. Um, one, you have to be a Vermont resident and you have to self attest when you sign up that you're a Vermont resident or you have moved within the last six months and intend to be a, uh, a Vermont resident. Those are the two criteria that we have. In both of those instances, you have to self attest. Do we, um, we're hoping that Vermonters, and we know that Vermonters uh, in most cases um, and perhaps in the vast majority of cases are self-attesting truthfully. I see, and there's no time requirement. Um, okay. well, well, you have to be. You and have to be. My other question. 
Yeah, you have to be a resident. To, to be a resident, you have to be here six months. But if you've moved within that six month period and you intend to be a resident, that qualifies as well. Okay. And my other question is a follow up from um, a question asked by Mike Donahue last Friday. Uh, have you gotten an update on the VA vaccine, vaccine distribution program? Um, I did. It was. Um, it was a, it was last week. Um, I don't know if it's ongoing. They're getting, and I will check on that. Um, but it is for those that are veterans and those that are 65 and over. And by the way, um, the more the the better in terms of what we can do in this state for vaccination. But you have to be a veteran and you have to be o over 65 in order to take advantage of the VA. And I, that's all I know, Lisa, right at the moment. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I wanna, yes. It, it's not part of our, our program. It, it comes in separately uh, to the VA. That's why I, I, I hesitate to talk, uh, you know, authoritatively about that program because um, like the governor was talking about, some of the pharmacy programs, like the Walgreen programs, I don't, it doesn't fall within our purview. So the VA program doesn't fall within our purview, and therefore I'm a little bit more vague about what is going on with the VA as opposed to the state program. I see. Thank you very much. Tom, Compass, Vermont. Tom, you have to hit star six to unmute. We got the first part of that, Tom. I'm sorry. The, uh, my question goes back to the UPS store in Hardwick and really more about enforcement following up. We had a lot of readers who are curious what happened. We understand the process you, the process is you first put the complaint into the portal and uh, Vermont government then screens through those and tries to determine which ones um, are actually real and valid and then goes through an education process with uh, local authorities. Uh, from there, if it doesn't work out, we understand it also goes to the attorney general's office. What doesn't seem to be as clear to folks is how much action is the attorney general's office taking? How often do they do more than just write a letter? And have they done full enforcement on any violators? Well, I can answer part of that. Um, thankfully, we haven't had that many that have elevated to the point the Attorney General has had to take action. But I can remember one in particular, and it was the Rutland Gym, um, and that actually went to court, I, I believe, and there was a, a decision made there, and, and it all ended uh, fine and from our perspective. Um, and this one uh, that I know of. Now, whether there's been others, I don't know. Commissioner Sherling might have um, more insight into this. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, you covered most of it. Uh, in almost every instance, there has been compliance gained as a result of a letter or letters and or discussions with uh, either the Attorney General's office or some cross-section of folks from the Department of Public Safety and local law enforcement. Um, so it's, uh, there just haven't been that many events, uh, really just the one that we're aware of that required uh, legal action. Everything else has been, uh, that has been elevated has been resolved. Okay, thanks very much. Tom, I don't know if I misheard you, but uh, the UPS store in question, that was, that was in Newport. I'm sorry, it was in Newport. You're right. Okay. Thank you, Governor. Yep. Yeah. Hey, Andrew, Caledonian Record. Uh, yes, good afternoon. Thank you. Um, uh, this is likely for Secretary Smith. Um, you mentioned additional appointments being added next week to several towns, including St. Johnsbury. Uh, do you have a number on how many appointments that increases, uh, either in totality or by town? And um, why were uh, these handful of communities selected for this? The um, total number, I think, of slots, and that's all I have uh, in terms of uh, what has been added is the total number of slots is 
is around 800 total number of slots. And the reason it was added is we had some vaccine that we couldn't use. Okay. And then um, somewhat on topic, have you been able to fold the doses that are getting directly allocated to the FQHCs into the state system, or how is that um, working out at this point? Yeah, I think the governor had talked about that. That's, um, that's a concern of ours, and I, I think it is actually a concern of coordination with the FQHCs. We've had a very good working relationship with the FQHCs and have allocated to some of the FQHCs actually state allocation. Now, as they roll on to the federal program, how do they sort of register? Do they use our registration system? How do we account for what's going on? Do we back off our, um, our allocation based upon what the federal allocation? How is this all coordinated? And the governor had, has mentioned this. Um, there is concern across the nation with governors, as he had mentioned, that you, you start layering on different programs that aren't connected to one another and the complexity of trying to keep all that coordinated becomes immense, depending on how many layers that you, uh, you put on. So um, to answer your question, we, we, we haven't figured that out yet in terms of how, what this is going to look like, what their allocations are going to be, how their allocations are going to be coming, in, in what size and how we coordinate all this. So have those direct allocations from the, the federal government not yet arrived at the FQHC? I don't think they have yet. Um, I'll have to double check on that, but I don't, I, you know, there is one that is scheduled to arrive. I'm not sure that it has yet. Okay. And then a um, uh, second topic on the school music guidance. This comes from a reader um, who's associated with a school music program um, wondering about the 30-minute rehearsal time limit uh, and why uh, sports teams can uh, play games or practice um, uh, for longer stretches of time than a music rehearsal. Uh, and they're wondering if there's any method to, um, to be able to practice longer than that, perhaps uh, changing physical locations or waiting for the air to clear and then resuming rehearsal after a certain amount of time. Secretary French. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, our music guidance came out this week. As I described, it is fairly technical, so we're, we're really interested in feedback and ways we can improve it. Uh, the 30-minute rehearsal time limit does come from the national recommendations. Um, and once again, we don't, we don't look at uh, student activities uh, on a comparative basis. We look at them specifically. So there's, there's quite a bit behind um, looking at music as a discrete activity relative to sports. And not to get too technical, but there's some things around the aspiration and so forth of students playing various instruments that necessitates um, specific uh, mitigation strategies for when they're using their instruments. So bottom line is that's kind of where we're at now. We're certainly looking for feedback as people begin to implement the guidance. Um, the last part of your question, um, the only way I think we would permit uh, extended rehearsals now is outside. Um, and albeit the weather's not that great for that, but hopefully soon we'll be able to, to do more of that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. That's it. Okay. Well, thank you very much for tuning in, and we'll see you again on Tuesday, hopefully with more good news.